Welcome, everyone. I'm Angelo Robles to the Angelo Robles podcast. I'm also the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. We're doing a, a different type of interview and session than I normally do, but I'm really, really looking forward to it. Building the life, business, and body you want with Paul Carter. And if you don't know who Paul Carter is, you better know what an amazing background he has and what really a tremendous business person, thought leader, and really, I look forward and hopefully many of you to learning from him as well. So a little bit of context to it, besides the ultimate workout routines, we'll discuss entrepreneurship, the fitness industry, building your brand, decision-making, self-improvement, and again, featuring Paul Carter. So to give a little bit of context, I first heard about Paul through his writing years ago, but I lost a little bit of track. So I belong to a gym, I'll give them a little bit of a shout out, called Fitness Edge in Norwalk, Connecticut. It's the suburbs of New York. Uh, and I you know, met someone, a young lady there who said, hey, I really subscribe to Paul's programs, follow his Instagram, lift, ring, lift run, bang. And like, wow, I was like really, really impressed by him. So I DM'd him, just had a chance to reach out. And those of you that are the big Paul Carter fanatics, and you should be, we're going to talk somewhat about exercise and fitness, but we're really going to focus a lot on the opportunity from a business perspective, whether you want to be in the fitness industry, want to be an entrepreneur, want to start a business, what to do after college, the value of social media and marketing. I mean, honestly, in probably 50 minutes, you're going to learn some things that you're not going to even learn, I know, from your four years in college. So Paul Carter, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Now, I'm also excited that you happen to be in Miami at the moment, so hopefully you're going to enjoy some time there in the sunshine. Yeah, um, uh, it's been a nice couple uh, couple of months. I've been out down here two times in, in the last month, so I'm enjoying Florida and, uh, and the freedom that we have down here. So I'll be here for a little for another couple of weeks. Nice. Maybe we'll cross over. I'm coming down the week of the 12th. I've been there two or three times myself this year. I host a series of events there and have business and personal interest in Miami. And certainly it's been really cool to get away from the colder weather here up north. Now, normally uh, you're based in Kansas City. So I'll give you my, now that I know you, Paul, so in order, so you're not going to be number one, unfortunately, but you may move up there. These are my, th my three favorite things about Kansas City. Oklahoma Joe's. <laughs> for those of you that don't know, that's a barbecue joint. So, Actually, yeah. So for people who don't know, it's out of a gas station. <laughs> yeah. That's what makes it pretty amazing. It you know, Oklahoma Joe's is pretty good barbecue, but I'm just, we're going to have to disagree. I, I, Jack Stack, I've been in Kansas City 20 years. Jack Stack barbecue, uh -huh. to me, hands down, is the best barbecue you're going to get in Kansas City. So the next time that you're in Kansas City, you let me know, and I'm there, and we'll go to Jack Stack, and we'll do a comparison to see if the Oklahoma Joe's Ooh. is better. That would be an honor. I look forward to it. I've been there four times, actually, all in the last 10 years, so do look forward to going back. Also, I would note Patrick Mahomes, although I'm a New York Giants fan, got to have respect. And now I'm going to put Paul Carter in there as well. So it's great to have you on. Why don't we get right to it? We're going to start initially a little bit on the fitness side. So what would you recommend to someone that is looking to, quote unquote, to get in better shape? I would say in imparting some of my business experiences, you want to clarify your purpose, what are your goals, and you want to kind of answer the why. And then what kind of habits and discipline are you going to put behind that? And how do you tie in the results, the outcomes to what you want? What would you say? Yeah, I mean, you pretty much nailed it there. I think the most important thing for people to determine is if they want to make a lifestyle change, understand that that's going to mean probably um, giving up some things that you're currently doing or doing some things that are probably very uncomfortable in comparison to where you have been at. Uh, one of the big things, especially, uh, that I, I really try to to get people to ascribe to is in, is to focus on habit based goals more times, and that habit based goals will get you the outcome based goals that you're usually striving for. So, a lot of times when people will do things like they'll say like I want to lose 20 pounds or I want to lose 30 pounds, and then they get addicted to the scale. So if this the, then their happiness or sense of fulfillment about you know how they're changing their life or what how it pertains to fitness becomes dictated to on what a weight set. So instead of doing things like that, a lot of times I'll try to get people into habit-based goals where it's like you're eating vegetables three times a day or you're getting 30 minutes in of walking. 
uh, every day or, or so many times a week, or you're getting to the gym so many times a week. And then what happens is over time, when you're very consistent in your in habit-based goals, that you're consistently hitting these new habits, um, a lot of times there's a, a multitude of factors that end up um, kind of a cascading throughout your life that happen. Number one is any type of keystone habit. A keystone habit is the habit, one habit that you change that ends up causing a multitude of other good habits in conjunction with that one thing. Exactly. So you start focusing on habit-based goals. Where you go, I'm going to eat vegetables three times a week. One of the best ones I like to give is um, a, a really good example of this is take somebody um, who would like a, a habit-based goal and they, they're going to eat, just have them eat a salad every day at lunch. People think that's so cliche, but if you have them eat a salad every day at lunch and walk 30 minutes each day, say what happens over the course of weeks is that they lose a little bit of weight. They feel a little bit, bit better. Their energy levels go up. And then the next thing is that they want to do a little something more. And so these are sustainable habits that they can do each day that makes them feel good uh, and helps them actually end up hitting those goals without them concentrating on the goal itself. So that's kind of one of those things I try to get people to focus on is like what, not necessarily like if you want to lose 30 pounds, what are the habits that you're going to need to practice each day and each week and each month mm -hmm. in order to get that 30 pound weight loss? But if the focus is constantly the goal, the other thing that happens there is a rival fallacy. And that is the belief that once you arrive at a certain destination or you achieve a certain thing, that there's going to be this sense of fulfillment and happiness. And there will be, but it'll be about this long. And <laughs> exactly. You'll be like, well, okay, so that happened. Because there's nothing, if you say, I want to lose 30 pounds and you lose the 30 pounds, when you lose the 30 pounds, they don't throw a parade out in you for you in the street, right? You, you know, nobody shows up at your house kicking the door down like and jumps out of a cake. So, you know, it's it's a sense of uh, instead of focusing on here's this outcome, I want to get into this size dress or I want to get, you know, lose this many pounds or I want to look like this fitness, you know, person or whatever. Those I don't like those type of goal settings. I like to really focus on what are just the habits that we need to create each day in our life to create a better life, to create better fitness, to create better business, to create better relationships. What are the habits I need to be focusing off of that? Yeah, that's great. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty open and direct, so I'll give my opinion. There's probably three main reasons why people would look to exercise and look better. One is certainly going to be, especially as we get a little bit older, we want to be more healthy. We want to be more mobile. We want the opportunity to be in better health as we age. And other for sure is athletic performance. But if I'm asked, Honestly, what's the number one reason why most people, it's a sense of vanity. It's bluntly to look good naked. <laughs> That's that, that once I retired from powerlifting six years ago, I said, the only thing I care about now is just being sexy. <laughs> I completely understand. Hey, it's that's, you know, what? if that's a motivation for you, and I think it's an anchor motivation for many people, I don't see anything wrong with that. I, I, it's something that keeps me very focused. It really does. And it's something I really enjoy. Um, the, the other things, and that's another, so I think about that. So like, and I think daily, what are, if I know that being sexy or staying sexy, um, if I'm, if I'm considered sexy, but the whole point is, is that in order to, to keep that goal or stay after that goal, like what are the habits I got to have each day? So I know like, I can't, um, I can't do get too crazy off my diet. You know, I can't give up my cardio. You know, I have to keep lifting. I have to keep uh, doing all the things. I have to look into other things like how do I do uh, better skincare routines and stuff like that. So there's when you when you have that one like in that that case when I say it sounds like a superficial goal, right? Because it, it is and it's not. Because if you aren't healthy internally, if you're not taking care of yourself, there's going to be an external manifestation of, uh, of that manifestation of that. So if if you're not taking care of yourself inside and out with your diet, uh, with your exercise, um, with, with stuff, doing stuff, like I said, a lot of guys, I have a buddy that is a former NFL player that I got into uh, to skincare and stuff like that because he said, hey, man, I just want to start taking better care of myself overall. And we went through a multitude of things. Uh, and he was an offensive guard, right? So he, this was not, not some like cornerback or wide receiver. Pretty well, this is a guy that was an offensive guard for 11 yeah. years in the NFL. And he said, how, like, what are the things that you do uh, to take care of yourself, you know, he gets to, you still look great, man. And so we talked about all the stuff. So he, he's had this really cool little shift there too, right. Of going from training from, you know, for all those years it, it to be play football and smash people and punch them in the mouth and to lift a bunch of heavy weights. So he's like, man, I, I just want to be sexy too. And I think there's a transition with that, that happens 
uh, once you give up the whole idea to lift, you know, X amount of weights, and I did that forever, or be X amount, it's like you have to be so big or whatever, uh, that transition and over into just taking a lot better care of yourself. And that's kind of like how I set my landmark was, um, how do I get really sexy? And then what are all the things I need to do just to, to feel good in my own skin? And that's another way I like to describe it. It's feeling, just feeling good in your own skin. Now, in terms of with your background, and for those that don't know, besides powerlifting and fitness, I mean, Paul was an engineer for a number of years. So he looks at things, I guess you could say, very analytically. And I love that about him and found that unique about him in the industry. What would you say to someone, even starting off to intermediate level, a lot of them are doing the exercises improperly. How do they identify a good trainer, even if it's not gonna be lifelong, just for maybe three, five or 10 lessons, and then I'm throwing a lot at you here, but what would you recommend in terms of full body initially, three days a week, a split, push and pull? What would be some general recommendations? Well, it's it's pretty tough um, these days. There's there's kind of a transition that's going on, um, and I'm fortunate enough to work with some really good guys in the functional anatomy department. So it's kind of hard at times now anymore uh, to pin down what I would consider uh, – really good trainers and i mean a lot of times if you're approaching a personal trainer in a gym you're going to have to ask questions like you know what what are your certifications or what are your you know what is your academic background and that kind of stuff um i mean and that's kind of a difficult thing to do because a lot of accreditations i would not consider to be uh to really mean anything there's lots of accreditations you can go to and get over the weekend you know study for and, and you know somebody that may have never spent more than a couple of months in a gym in their life. So do you trust that person to train you? So I think one of the things it comes back to, how many years has this, this person spent training themselves? What's the amount of time and diligence they put into their own personal education? Uh, and then do they have a portfolio of people that they have gotten into shape um, and, and things like that? Just from a overall, like what's your, basically what is your, what is your job experience? Uh, and then from there, I, I kind of work on a different level because I don't train people in person. But going back to your question is um, when people start thinking about stuff like splits and stuff like like that, from all of the current research that we that we have right now, there's not any um, benefit necessarily to doing a whole body or what we call like a bro split uh, or push full legs type split each one from the last meta analysis that was done that looked at the uh, aspect of frequency when it comes to mu muscle growth. When it looked at frequency, there wasn't any one way that was more superior than the other. So a lot of people will say, well, if you, you need to train a muscle twice a week or, you know, bro splits don't work. And there's been a, a lot of things said over the past, I don't know how many years about that, but in the last meta analysis, it ended up confirming a lot of what most of us thought. And that was, um, Frequency is just a way to manage training volume. So if you want to train using like, a, you know, like a chest and black back, shoulders and arms and then legs split, that's fine. It's going to work just as well as a full body split done three times a week when the amount of work you've done throughout the week is basically e equated for as equal. So there's no one particular way. I was going to, that part's going to come back to personal preference. Yeah. And one more question on that. We'll come back to exercise a little bit later, but I really want to get into the business side is initially we're taught and probably taught the wrong form that the classics are the bench press, the deadlift, possibly the trap bar a little bit easier on the back uh, and the squat. And that's not necessarily incorrect in some ways, I would assume. And for athletic performance, like the offensive lineman you mentioned, for sure. But if your goal is overall better health and to look better, those are probably not, at least not the barbell bench press, probably not the best from an aesthetic, a muscle growth perspective. Would you agree? Yeah, I actually harp on that quite a bit, to be honest, because uh, spending a decade in powerlifting, I did a lot of squats, benches, and deadlifts, right? Okay, that's pretty much all I did for 10 years uh, every week. But when you start talking about um, pure muscle growth, hypertrophy, like we were talking about earlier, taking care of yourself and actually growing muscle and looking sexier, um, those exercises are really not, number one, they're not, uh, they're not only are they not very good for most people, they're just not really good overall. 
So there's kind of a misconception that still goes on a lot. I tend to end up getting into a lot of debates about this particular thing. Number one, the barbell is not really a very good tool when it comes to muscle growth. It has some significant limitations in comparison to, say, dumbbells, cables, and some particular machines. Um, and the barbell has some significant limitations when it comes to really loading muscle tissue the way you want to load it in order to mechanically uh, overload that tissue to cause it to grow. So um, one of the things that we do is that we look at people's structure and we get them lined up with exercises that actually fit their, their particular structure and their leverages. So that way, when they execute those movements, they actually are targeting the very specific muscles that they're trying to train. So when you talk about hypertrophy and muscle growth, believe it or not, those big exercises like squats, benches, or deadlifts, or whatever that work a lot of muscles at one time, one of the reasons they're actually not that great is because they do work a lot of muscles at one time. So if you're just somebody who's just trying to increase that level of fitness, sure, they might be an okay exercise. But if you're actually trying to target very specific areas of muscle, you don't want to be hitting a whole bunch of different muscles. You want to be targeting very specific muscles that you're trying to overload and create mechanical tension in. So when you talk about a deadlift, somebody will say, well, it's a full body exercise. I'm like, well, the fact that it's a full body exercise is exactly why it's not a good muscle growth selection movement because you're hitting your erectors, some of your upper back in terms of uh, stabilization, you're hitting your glutes and your hamstrings, but you're not hitting any of them with a concentrated degree of tension. So when you spread that tension all over like that, and there's no one area that's really one getting smashed, then that is one of the things that actually makes it not a very good hypertrophy um, movement. So we t I tend to select movements to use that really focus on that target tissue so we can grow those muscles, right? So if you want to grow um, hamstrings, you know, you want to do something like a leg curl or a step leg deadlift that really hits the hamstrings hard. If you want to do a chest movement, you want to do something that's converging, that brings the arm across the body, right? Because that is one of the functions of the pecs is to actually horizontally adduct the humerus. So you want to actually train the muscles uh, in a way that where you, for example, there's a multitude of things that, that come to play there, that the vector, which is basically like, say, if you're trying to train, train your chest, you know, the arm is going to have a direct relationship on which area mm -hmm. division of the chest gets maximally hit. And then not only that, but the load itself, right? If you're holding a dumbbell in your hand. So that's the, the line of pull, or if you're using a cable, how it's set up. So there's a multitude of things that come into play there that make good hypertrophy movements. You want a high degree of stability in a movement. So another thing that makes movements, like say if you're standing, the lowest degree of stability is stuff like say you're standing on a BOSU ball, right? There's not a lot of stability there. So the, high, the more stability that you have in a movement, the more you're able to have a high degree of output by the muscles that you're trying to train. So when you get in a leg press, right, what do you have to do to get into a leg press and work your legs? You just sit down in the leg press, you know, grab the handles, get your body tight, and then go to work and train your legs really hard. But if you're doing a squat, think about all the different ways you have to stabilize internally in order to squat well. So with a leg press, you actually have a higher degree of stability just because of the actual seat than you do in a squat. So if you really wanted to pound your legs without worrying about your form breaking down or using other muscles to uh, help compensate for, for the load, the leg press is often a better option. Very good advice. Okay, Paul, let's have some fun. I've been looking forward to it. One of my favorite subjects, especially applicable, I'm going to say to young people and those in college, it's how to be successful in business. And it could be a blue collar, it could be a creative industry and some of the things we're going to talk about are probably more geared to that and why why you can't make a million dollars a year or more don't think low well i want to be in fitness and make 75 to 100k that's a really low benchmark you could do better than that and those of you that are in college that are looking to maybe form an agency on social media marketing uh, and what you're learning in marketing and business in general in college yeah it's history it's a foundation honestly a lot of it is not up to date on a lot of the things that are occurring in the real world. So in, in half an hour, we'll try to give you a condensed lesson. Let's see what we could do. I am gonna start with a quote that I know gave you a chuckle from the legendary bodybuilder, Ronnie Coleman. Here it goes. Everybody wants to get rich, but ain't nobody wanna take big ass chances. 
or I'm going to add in or do the work. And that is so true. Yeah, like, of course, you want to be rich, you want to be successful. What are your habits? What are you sacrificing? How are you being self-educated? What are you learning? And then if you're really, really, really good at what you do, and no one knows who the hell you are, you don't know how to market, you know, it's not going to do you any good. So let me start with one example for you, Paul. Uh, so let's just assume someone wants to make 100000 a year being in the fitness industry. And let's say they charge $75 an hour for one-on-one -on -one training. Uh, so they need to make $2,000 a week, 50 weeks a year. They only need to have 27 working hours a week. I'm not saying they're going to start off doing that, but they should be able to build up to that. I think if they're good and good at marketing, honestly, after a couple of months, $75 an hour, uh, you know, times 27 working hours. Uh, I'm going to get into a thousand true fans, Kevin Kelly and all of that in a second, but why don't we start at that foundation first, Paul? I agree. So I, I, I really like the idea here of jumping off the whole thousand true fans thing, because that was something you said prior to us like recording that I think is so important for people to understand. Um, I'm friends with, I don't know if you know who Jordan Syed is. He's up in the New York area too, but Jordan has, he has, he's made that very same quote. Jordan has, I think he's got uh, over 700,000 followers, but wow. something we talked about is that it is not about followers. It is about consumers. It is about buyers. Who shows up organically and sees your stuff and sees the value in it? So not to disparage anybody, but if you're a hot chick these days, if you're a mega hot chick and you're half naked on social media, you can end up with a lot of followers. It so helps. I've dated some of those. And <laughs> I, I dated one that had more than a million followers. And I told her, I said, if I had a million followers, I would have five yachts right now. And she said, you, she said, you don't have followers. You have consumers. She said, I have a million dudes that are just looking at my ass every day. So she couldn't make the kind of money that I could make on social media, despite the fact that my following is nowhere near a million because I have consumers. I have people to see a value in my service. Okay. So like it does, I've, I've heard this, this particular story um, from a, quite a few other females that had really massive followings and then they would try to sell shirts or they would try to sell pictures. Or yeah, merch and stuff, that. sure. And they couldn't do anything with it because, um, and, and some people say, are you saying there's no value? I'm saying, right, there's so many, and I, again, the, it, you have to you gotta tread carefully here people get their panties in a bunch, but there's so many half naked women all over social media that guys literally go through there, you know, double tap it, go right, roll, roll right on to the next one. So if you're looking to really monetize, um, you have to be willing to offer up something that people don't feel like they can really get anywhere else. And then you have to do it in a way that feels connected. So like, I'm not always like what I consider, some people say that I'm not like the nicest person in the world online. If I get a stupid question, I'll say that's a really dumb question. But I think people also see the authenticity that I have when I when I connect with people, even if that means that I'm being an a-hole at times, according to them. But the main thing is, is that you don't need you don't need tons and tons and tons of followers. You need some really dedicated consumers who see a lot of value in the product that you are providing. So go in terms of thinking of this way, if you had 5,000 people, and I'm terrible at math, so you can do the math for me on that one. But if you only had 5,000 people, let's say you had a following of 50,000 people and you had 5,000 people of, of that's that's 10%, right, of your 50,000. If you know only 10% of your following gave you 20 bucks a month. Exactly. Math on that, dude. That is a crazy amount of money. That's a crazy amount of money. And so what you have to be able to do is step up and provide a service. Uh, in a way that this person goes, wow, there's a lot of value in that. There is, I'm learning a lot from this. I'm getting a lot out of this. The people who end up growing, because it's there's a there's a doubling effect there. If if you are providing a high degree of value and content each day on social media, and you have the 1,000 people, or you have the 2,000 people, or 5,000 people that consistently purchase uh, whatever product that you're curating, then what happens over time is 
those people tell people and those tell people and you have results. And so it just it extrapolates on itself, right? It just gets bigger and bigger from there. It's not the overall following number you need to be looking at. It's the quality of information that are going to attract people who are going to consistently purchase product from you. No doubt about it. I completely agree. And taking a, a little bit of that step back, the person who is early in their fitness training career and really dedicated and assuming they're good and they're making whatever 40 or 50 K then just take a look at some of the analytics and statistics and it's basic. How many clients do I have and how much am I charging them? Yeah. Maybe I'm undercharging them. If I could double the price by quadrupling the value, they may be willing to pay that. If I do that with no new clients, I doubled my income. Now, how about, and I've worked with some trainers, uh, and some of them are really talented and great, but how come they're not pressing me for more hours in business? How come they're not asking for family and friends? These are basic things in marketing and in sales, where if I double that and I doubled what I'm charging them for the value I'm providing, I now effectively quadrupled my income, maybe from making 40 or 50K to making 100 or 50 or 200. Am I saying any of that is easy? It's not easy, but right. the steps to do it the steps to do it are relatively simple and straightforward. Right. You just have to kind of put in the work. But, you know, you're thinking at even a bigger and a higher level. You know, what are your goals? How much money do you want to make? What's the math behind it? And how do you work backwards to get there? So I mentioned the legendary Kevin Kelly of Wired Magazine is renowned. He's been on Tim Ferriss. I would love to get them on. I'm trying a thousand true fans and you're kind of made for life. I can even, so if a thousand people are true advocates, something like what you said earlier, and they give you a hundred dollars a year each, that's it. It's relatively modest. That's right. your hundred thousand right there. And if you only have a hundred true fans, do the math again, they give you a thousand dollars each. That's so maybe you start free you funnel up to $100 a year, that's 100,000. Then you have a higher level group that pays you $1,000, maybe on Patreon. And please don't tell me you don't know what Patreon is, everyone. Especially if you're younger, you should be familiar with it. These are ways to be a force multiplier. That's what you damn well should have been learning in school and probably didn't. Listen to Peter Thiel, he'll teach you a thing or two. So Paul, I'm kind of just reiterating some of the things you said in maybe a little different way but I would love to hear your opinion or if you wanted to add to that. Yeah, so my one of my mentors was uh, the legendary Charles Poliquin, who was oh, considered, well, Charles was considered by most people the greatest strength and conditioning coach um, ever. Um, I mean, he trained more than 50 gold medalists. Um, he, he worked with, I don't know how many hundreds of like people in, 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 uh, in professional hockey and the NFL and everything. And Charles and I ended up being very good friends. In fact, I was the one that wrote like his eulogy for bodybuilding.com. Yeah, that was really sad. What about a year and a half ago? Yeah, so um, when Charles and I, were, we had conversations about business quite often. And one of the things that Charles impressed upon me was he's like, stop trying to, don't try to, to get out there and get money. He said, try to educate yourself so you can create the absolute best product and service that's available. And then from there, something that we talked about earlier, then you have to understand how do I market this in a really effective way? But the first step in all of that is your own self-development, right? You could, have, you could have the best marketing strategy in the world, but eventually people are going to see through your bullshit. Like you need to have a product uh, a degree of education, a degree of knowledge, a degree of wisdom, and then it's some experience clearly to go along with that, that creates that synergistic effect that gives you a high functioning business model. So he consistently said, always your focus should always be on your own personal education improvement. That doesn't mean you have to go to school. It doesn't mean you have to get certifications. But at minimum, you got to find people to work with that are freaking smarter than you are. And there's always somebody smarter than you are. <laughs> always. And, right. And so with you, me, a lot of them smarter. <laughs> one of the things that's difficult to do for a lot of people with that is to admit you don't know everything. Now, that is a, a much harder thing than you think it is for a lot of people, because um, just from my perspective in the fitness industry, uh, there's a lot of ego, clearly. And what I mean by that ego is for people to simply admit they've maybe been doing something wrong. I don't have a problem with that. If I'm like, you know, if you know a better way, show me. I have a good enough built-in bullshit meter that I can tell you when something is bullshit. 
but if you're not growing in terms of your education and, and your, your knowledge base, like that is everything that you're working off of right there because you get clients that come in and the better you're able to develop a client, well, that's your business card. You know, that's the stuff you post up on your social media. Here's my clients that are crushing it. Okay. And then you get more clients from that and then you get more clients from that, but you have to have the knowledge base to work with in order to create that. And a lot of people simply don't have the knowledge base. So they want the clients. They're like, I want the money. I want the clients. I want the followers. I want these things. And they have it backwards. It's, 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 it's not an intuitive process. You need to be able to say, okay, the most important thing that I have to do is be patient enough now to develop the knowledge base I'm going to need to be an amazing coach at what I'm doing. In, if you want to be in fitness, right? So you have to start there and it's a never ending process. You don't just wake up one day and, and you're like, okay, it's like, you know, reading the Bible where you're at the, you're just finished the last page of revelation. You know, there's a whole lot more like you, you just have to keep going. So there's a never ending process of developing that knowledge base, that education, no matter how you're going about doing it. And the, one of the things I, I consistently tell people, even if you get a, a degree or if you get certifications, always try to seek out people that you can learn from that are smarter than you in specific areas, whether it be nutrition, whether it be training, whatever it might be, Good. consistently find those people who can put you in very uncomfortable places so that you continue to grow. And then from there, what will happen is, as long as you have a good business model, that will grow. The money will come. But he, he impressed that upon me all the time. Never, ever stop growing in terms of your education, your knowledge, your wisdom. And, and that, that has to come first. That's amazing advice. I completely agree. And it's sometimes harder as you start to have some success. But having that beginner's mindset is really important. I know you're a fan because you follow. And I was very fortunate to interview him for multiple hours a year and a half ago. That's Tony Robbins. And what you learn about him, and he's such a dynamic presence in person, a huge guy, about 6'8", you know, 280. And just the things that he talks about in terms of, you know, your knowledge, a beginner's mindset, and over-deliver on what you're telling people that you're going to deliver on. You know, I, I would almost say to some degree, you need to over-promise. I know that's controversial, but over-deliver as well. So over-promise and over-deliver sometimes are strategies for me that I've learned that have worked. Uh, so like, for instance, if you're earlier on and you have an intellectual approach being an engineer, you know, why aren't you learning how to be a better writer? Uh, why aren't you submitting content to bodybuilding.com, to muscle and fitness, to T Nation? Oh, but they get thousands of people. Well, you don't know if you're, you're not going to be the one. If you don't try, you don't know. How do you then take YouTube following and IG following and how do you monetize that more? And we'll maybe get to merch and stuff like that later, but how do you put specific content on Patreon and how do you charge even five or $10 a month with the right number of people, that's real money. If you're more of a writer, then how about Substack? I mean, there's never been more tools available to people than there are right now from video to writing to social media. I just sometimes think that people are not putting, you know, th they're not putting the two plus two plus two together. Yeah, you hit on some really good points there that I, I got personal experience in that you're, you're knocking it out of the park on. And I hope people that, that watch this really are paying attention. And it'll be this. And that is the you're talking about over promise and over, over delivery on results. But and I'll add to that in, is that you have to saturate your feeds with the, the service that you're offering. And I think so many people do a crap job of that. And I'll give you one was my girlfriend. And so <laughs> when we started, um, we started talking about her business. I said, and I learned this to go back to Charles Pollock when he told me the same thing is that I've written nine different books. And like we had before he passed away, I, I finally asked him after a year, I was like, Hey, would you give this one book a, 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 some promotion? And he goes, I didn't even know you wrote it. Now you gotta understand we're close friends. And he told me, he griped, he, he, he really, he griped at me and he, he, uh, he said, you do an absolute garbage job of promoting your work. He goes, you, you, you put out great work you do, but you do a garbage job of promoting it. He said, if you're not showing up every day, right, to promote your product, you're failing. He's like, you have to promote your product every day. And he's like, you've had a book out that you wrote. He goes that I, for, I didn't even know about for a whole year. And I was like, okay. So I basically 
said, okay, what has to happen is, is I do have to wake up every day and I have to let people know I have a service that I'm offering, whether it's a book, okay? Whether it's a book, whether it's a online client service, whether it's a subscription site, whatever it is you have, if you're not letting people know about this on the daily, you're missing business, okay? You are missing business every day. So I told my girlfriend, because she's like, I hate doing that. I was like, I was the same way because it feels like you're just constantly pushing your service on people. But the fact is, if you want to grow exponentially, you have to wake up every day and figure out how do I continue to get more subscribers, more clients, sell more product, whatever it is you're trying to do. So I told her, you have to advertise every single day. And her business has absolutely exploded since then. And she's, she gets clients daily, weekly now, but she actually promotes her service every day rather than just promoting it here or there when she was just getting a client here or there. So what I tell people about that is, look, you have to give up that whole, I don't want to push something down people's throat. I had another guy that I'm friends with that's a best-selling author. And he said, if you, have a, if you haven't promoted or piss six people off by noon each day, you're failing in your business. <laughs> I, I love that one. one. Love that because he's like, you know, he's like if you're going to be an authentic person on social media in real life, whatever, he goes, you're going to have some people that think you're the greatest thing since sliced bread and other people are going to hate you for that very same stance. So if you he say, he'd always say, if you haven't pissed six people off by noon, he goes, you're failing. He goes, the other thing is like, if you, haven't, if you haven't gotten six new, like at least people that are questioning whether or not they should have your service or buy your book or whatever. He was not, he's an author. He's a best-selling author. He's like, you're also failing. So as your job, until you make it and say, let's say you have, you know, $10 million in the bank and you're like, I don't really need to do this anymore. But if that's your goal, you're trying to get to a place and you're not consistently waking up each day and finding out how do I, how do I drum up more business? How do I do more self-development? Who do I seek out to improve, to, to, to increase my knowledge base? It's a constant synergistic effect, right? How do I get better? How do I make better content? How do I promote my business better? Um, how do I work with my clients better? All these things. It is a daily, you talked earlier, it's a daily, there's a daily grind involved in that. If that's what you want to do. So these things all work hand in hand, but uh, the thing I would have to say where most people fail the most, once they have have once they do have some semblance of a knowledge base or an education or they have results with clients or whatever, is they usually don't do a very good job of promoting the service that they're offering often enough. So if you have a great service and you're really good at your job and nobody knows that you do it, how do you grow your business? Yeah, I mean, probably the greatest business management consultant of all time, the legendary Peter Drucker. You know, he was like, you know, the four years in college and then graduate degree and all that. Yeah, I mean, it had its purpose. But if I had to just tell you, learn how to create, learn how to market and learn how to sell just because you reach people, like you said, with the ladies on Instagram, but they yep. don't have an engaged audience, they're not converting them. And those of you that are listening that are doing marketing or graduating college, uh, everything is flipped upside down with COVID. You're learning things that are often 10 or 20 years old in college. If you're not learning relative from marketing about social media, about digital assets, about NFTs, we're going to get to some of that. It's going to be a little off topic, but we're going to get there. You should be able, years, in my opinion, only within two or three years after college, if you do this right, you should be building an agency and making a million dollars a year or more. You don't need to work for a company. You could do it. In my I'll, opinion, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this, you're, you're never, ever, if, if your desire is to, to make a significant amount of money, it's probably not going to happen working for another person. So that's one of the first things, right? I know you laugh at that, but I said, I was a computer engineer. And when I was a computer engineer for 15 years, I made very good money, but I wanted to make like really good money, next level money, seven figure money. And then right. You realize one day you're like, man, I'm just dreaming because I won't ever make seven figures working for another company. There's going to be a cap on how much I can make, even if I'm making good. So you have to, and you said earlier, you have to be willing to take risk. And a lot of people, they get comfortable and they just aren't willing to take any risk. So there's a story there too that you'll like. And that is after working 15 years in computer engineer, as a computer engineer, we had a changeover in management at the company I was at. It was very stable. And they brought in a completely new management style. They transferred me off the, the type of systems that I worked on. I hated my job, every part of it. We had this on-site manager that come on that was a, is a, he was a total jerk. And uh, they ended up firing me. 
15 years and they fired me and my my fitness business was just a little side business at the time a side hustle was yeah. the best thing that ever happened to you it, dude it, so here's the thing here here's that thing so um I was making $75,000 a year at, with it as a side business, um, but I was making $125,000 a year as a computer engineer. So I was doing pretty well. I decided I didn't ever want to go back to IT anymore. I don't know if you ever seen the movie Office Space. <laughs> yeah, yes, I did. That was my life. That was literally everything in that movie. That, that sounds started. terrible. So I didn't want to go back to that. So this is what I did. I took out $20,000 out of my retirement and took the hit on it. So that way I could float myself for the first year. You took a risk. That's what you did. That's what we said about Ronnie Coleman's quote earlier. I ever did. Now I make more in like a quarter of the year than I was making back then. But the point is you have to be willing. You have to be willing. Some people would say like, oh, I don't want to take that hit on the, on the penalty I'll get or my retirement or whatever. But that was, how many years ago was that now? That was like seven years ago, six or seven years ago. Best decision I ever made in my life, bar none, as far as, especially as far as business goes. I've never worked for anybody since then. I make, I make infinitely more money now. I have more freedom of life. Like, and then I understood, I understand the value also in scalability. Like, because I want to continue to grow my own businesses. And I'm like, how do I grow these, you know? How do I prosper in these other ways? But if I hadn't, and I remember at the time I had friends who advised me against that. They're like, you're going to take a hit on that, whatever. And I was like, my goal, my vision at the time was so much bigger. And everybody I know that has gotten to that next level in their life has a story like that. All of them. Everybody I know that's gotten there has a story where they're like, I don't want to work at that Starbucks anymore. I don't want to work at whatever. They all have that story where they just got fed up and hit the wall and took that risk. And they're like, sink or swim. I'm going to do it this time. And then I'm not saying it works for everybody, but you it sure as hell won't work for you if you never step out there and take that risk. No doubt about it. Investing in yourself, multiplying your income. Uh, that's going to be more value than working as an employee for an employer. Eventually, if you invest properly, having your investment income even earn you more money than what you're making, that's kind of the holy grail. Uh, but we'll save that discussion for a different time. So I'm probably going to adapt the title of this session. It's going to be a little bit catchy, and we kind of hinted at it. And that basically is being a creative in the world of fitness or building an agency in marketing basically how to make a million dollars a year. So we're aiming really big. Let's forget that 100,000. Although those are good early benchmarks and training. So some of the things I would say is to amplify the things that we spoke about. How active is the fitness community on TikTok? Could you get an advantage being early? How active are you on IG? How are you creating your brand? What writing and videos are you doing? We mentioned Patreon and Substack. Are you active on Reddit posts? Uh, have you considered ads when social media? Have you considered hiring an influencer, maybe via an affiliate, and paying them 70 or 80 percent commission on what comes in? Until you reach that stage of being a social media influencer yourself, like Paul is, and hopefully you will get there, you may need to leverage and buy into someone else, even if even if it costs money or part of a comp. And then we get into things like. Uh, PR and media, affiliate links, merchandising. I'm throwing the kitchen sink at you, Paul. And I know we probably only have about 15, 20 minutes left. How would you be more succinct in terms of what I said to go from 100,000 to a million dollars a year? So like you have to build that out, right? Like, so we said like 100,000, right? It's not, it's not difficult. When I say difficult, like getting to 100, it's still a, a landmark, right? Like in other words, before you ever deadlift 600, you got to deadlift 500 and you got to the 400 for that, right? You, can, you know, unless you're just, you know, some freak of nature and just can do that right out of the gate. But generally you have, yes, you have to, but it's completely realistic to set a goal and say, I want to be making a million dollars a year in fitness, or I want to be making 500,000 or whatever you want to be making. And so, yeah, you got to get to that hundred thousand first, like I did with the 70, like 75 as a side business. So what people don't often understand is, you probably are going to do a lot more work in the early parts of that and make less where it's later you will learn how to do less work and make more and that absolutely right. does freaking happen right uh you talked about tony robbins earlier like tony could probably like because of just where he's at he can do less work now 
and make more money than he was doing, say, 20 years ago because of who he is. But he had to do the early work, right? So a lot of people don't understand that. I wrote over 3,000 articles over eight years. So that's the early work, right? So um, I wrote, I didn't even know I liked to write. I, I discovered writing as just kind of a, a thing that I was doing. Uh, I wanted to write a novel. I had all these stories in my head. This is this pertains to fitness, but it, maybe it will help somebody. I had all these stories in my head from the time I was a kid, these like fantasy action stories, like Lord of the Rings stuff. And I was, uh, to the woman I was married at the time I was telling her about it, she's like, well, those are fantastic. You should like write it. i would never written anything in my life. So I decided to write this novel and I wrote a novel over two years just for myself and I would read it to my kids. But I learned in that process, I really loved writing. So I started a blog. Um, I'm kind of a like a, you know, like when you hear about a band that got really famous you know, they were playing at dive bars and then just happened like a studio executive season one night. They become <laughs> It's kind of like that. I was actually I wrote I had a blog. I started a blog because I like to write. And I was friends with a guy named Jim Wendler at the time, who was uh, the senior editor for Elite FTS, which is like the biggest powerlifting website, right? So me and Jim, we we uh, we talked to each other every day through email, and he'd ask me for one day, he's like, "What are you working on?" I'm like, "I just I just have this little blog, and I just write my own little articles." And he's like, "Well, can I read them?" And I was like, "No." And he's like, "Come on, dude, let me let me take a peek." So I let him read. He's like, "Dude, these are so." good he's like this is the best shit i've I'm, i've read anywhere yeah, you're a good writer so he said he asked me he goes can we publish some of your work at elite fts the interesting thing about it is most people are begging to be discovered begging to be published begging to get some visibility and i said absolutely not i don't want anybody to read my stuff so he stayed after me forever he's like dude just let us publish one of your articles just one nothing happens won't bother you again they published it it blew up um they came back to me and he was like, Dave Tate, who's he, Dave wants to know if you'll write like six more articles for us. And I was like, no. So he stayed after me and I wrote multiple other articles for Elite, Elite, Elite FTS and it, they blew up. And then uh, I ended up having other companies see my work, uh, T-Nation, Bodybuilding.com, Muscle and Fitness, Flex. And that all happened over the course of years where all these other places saw my work and said, dude, will you write for us too? So then... Elite FTS, they never paid me. So then I found myself in a position where all these other companies were paying me on a per article basis. And then I ended up doing seminars from there. I ended up making contacts. But I also did stuff during those years when I decided I kind of wanted to grow this whole fitness business a little bit. Is that I I did stuff like I made um, made trips to like expos and met people and, and did networking and stuff like that. I wasn't just sitting at home posting on the internet. I actually got out there and, and did the things, right? Like you have to get out and do the things. Like you can do a lot from home, but there's something to be said and we can't, you know, this past year because of the whole year. <laughs> but you used to, yes. you get out, you can go to expos, you can meet people, you connect, and you make better, deeper, authentic relationships that way. So I took years to do that. So think of over the course of all the, the years that I've been doing this, um, there was no overnight one way. It was a multitude of processes that unfolded from 3,000 plus articles to nine books to getting out to doing tons of expos to tons of seminars or whatever. And then people will often ask me questions like, well, how do I get to where you are? I'm like, I don't know because I didn't intend for this to happen. I was just writing on a blog. But what happened is over the years is I did want to grow that. I just focused on making good connections, putting out a good product, and then the business stuff started unfolding more from there. But I stayed true to what Charles had told me, develop your knowledge base, develop your education. And I made good friendships and good relationships. And those carried me a long ways. Yeah, and that's a great story. We all think of it as being an overnight success. They don't realize the discipline, the habits, the sacrifices that we gave up. I hear Gary V talk about he, in New Jersey, went to New York City to party like once in his 20s. He made sacrifices then so he could live the life and make $10 million or more a year like he's doing now. And most people are not willing to make those sacrifices. And I do think there are some things you could do to 
to amplify or do that faster. Even what you said about writing in blogs, you can then piece them together, go on Kindle, create an ebook. People think of authors as being, you know, key figures, deep thought leaders. That's another way to grow. I didn't even talk about Amazon and products. And again, you could do affiliate deals. I know people that make seven figures because they build up the right social media presence and email database. That's important too. learn how to build a Slack group and then do affiliate deals and merch depending on your brand with, with them. Uh, you know, I had a great guest on, it's my most popular video of all time on YouTube. He's probably the king of Bitcoin right now, Michael Saylor at MicroStrategy. And like, what did you learn four years at MIT? And he basically said these three words and that kind of was it. Think for yourself, think for yourself. I mean, that really is so simple. It really gets right to the heart of it. The other principle that I would recommend to people to amplify and grow from whatever 50 to 100 to half a million to a million is know the Pareto principle of 80-20. Uh, why not apply the 80-20 rule, meaning that uh, it- 20% 20, 20 of the stuff that you do gets you 80% of the results. That's it, but let's take that a step further. So how about if you keep on multiplying that, that's 64% of effects from just 4% of the causes and do it again, 51.2% of the effects from 0.8% of the causes. This is relatively easy math, but you need to have some level of structure and discipline, know how to chart what's working, what's not working, and then really have a chance to amplify it. I would also look at the young millennials coming up in the younger, well, the Generation Z is what I meant, you know, what are they interested in? What things that exist physically can now be moved to the digital world? And, you know, how will the ownership of, of creativity change in the future? And that does lead me a little bit, Paul, that I think your industry is knocking on the door, but they're not there yet. This could actually take someone to possibly be in a multi-million dollar or more earner. And that is what is going on in the world of Web3, the metaverse, what you broadly know in Bitcoin and crypto, but take it into the blockchain and take it into NFTs. So how could you create custom content for those top 100 fans where you do a video series that's exclusive as an NFT? And in theory, if that takes off and they begin to sell it, you even get a percentage of that. So now that takes the principle of a thousand fans down to a hundred to maybe even a top 10 or 50 fans. So learn about social tokens, learn about NFTs. And it's not quite as complicated as it appears from the outside looking in. And especially if you're in marketing and want to create an agency and you don't know about this stuff, you're, you're kidding me. You're, you're done, you're toast. You could do this and make seven figures. You just have to wrap your arms around it. Like imagine if, now Paul's an engineer, so he, he'll probably figure it out. But imagine if you approached Paul and said, hey, I think I can make you an extra million dollars a year by you creating non-fungible tokens, NFTs and social tokens. Let me prove myself to you first, then we'll you know, deal with our contract and payment. He would probably be open to it. So have you looked into some of the new digital world and the things that I'm talking about? No, like right now, I know what you're talking about. I haven't ventured off into that. And one of the things that I end up doing a lot of is trying not to spread myself too thin across platforms. Like the other one, the next one that I plan on um, expanding significantly would be uh, my YouTube. Because I haven't done YouTube stuff in the last few years because I really got to where I wanted to maximize the amount of growth I was getting out of my Instagram. So probably I have some landmarks that I want to hit on Instagram and then with subscribers and then with stuff like that. And then I will start venturing over into some other things. But I, the way that I tend to do that, I personally tend to do things. Um, it's kind of like with training. If you say, I want to get ripped, big, strong, all these things at one time, you don't end up maximizing any of them. You end up getting a little bit of each. Um, you only have, for me, I only have so much time um, in the day and so much energy in the day because I run um, my train heroic platform too. And I have lots of subscribers on there. So right now, my focus is really just maximizing the amount of good content that is collecting more subscribers. And then from there, I'll figure out down the line 
what's going to be number one, the biggest thing that I thought about lately, like what is going to be, what is it that I'm putting my time and energy to that's going to be really sustainable? Like what is going to be sustainable? Because I don't think a lot of people think about that either, because some, something that's may, even making you say 50,000 a month right now, that may, what if that only has a lifespan for you for the next say year and a half or two years? Yeah, you'll make great money then, but well, then what do you do after two, two years? If you don't understand how to find other avenues that will also supplement that income, but then also other ways that are going to be sustainable long term. So like one of the things that I think about now going forward is how do I make my subscriber list bigger, larger, more scalable? And one of the things that have to happen there down the line is actually hiring out like other coaches, like hiring out other people that I train up, um, that I help educate. And then that helps me run that subscriber list because like one of the goals that I have there is to get to more than 10,000 subscribers. So, but I, you can't get to 10,000 subscribers and answer 10,000 people and give them a really good coaching and training experience every day all by yourself. So then you have to think how many, every so many thousand subscribers, how many, like how much staff do I have to hire out at that point? So do I have to hire out two people for every 3,000 subscribers? Do I have to hire out four people for every exactly. 5,000? So it's a, right now that's been um, my main focus because I've noticed um, basically this kind of effect between how fast I'm growing between my social media and how many subscribers are coming onto my training platform. So right now that has been my sole focus because there's always, here's the other thing I think people have to think about. You have a limited lifespan on how long your product is also going to be relevant unless you, you know, you have something that ends up lasting forever. But most people have a, a, a period where they're really relevant, right? Like where their product or their information is going to be real as going to be at a high degree of relevance. So, Right now, I have like a certain time span that I'm focusing on where I'm like, I really need to maximize this particular business approach to get the most out of it. So that way I can be like, OK, that's, you know, that is going to be even if something drops off, it's gotten so large uh, and I've hired out so well um, that I don't have anything to worry about. Yeah, I mean, that's really building a team. And again, I know I'm active in digital assets, NFT, social tokens. I think people should be creating agencies, helping people like you in fitness, those in entertainment and music and sports. Those are opportunities right now to potentially kind of make a killing. And I think you could even do it in your earlier mid 20s. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. It takes work. Now with your brand, something that you could do like what Tony Robbins and others do, I haven't quite done it yet. I'll probably do it shortly is again, here's what the free people get. Here's what those that are $100 a year, $1,000 a year doing NFTs that goes up. And maybe the ultimate is I'm going to take 10 people that they need to pay me $40,000 a year. And I'm going to create a mastermind series for them. They get this daily. They get this from my team. We meet once a quarter. You know, they come to me in Kansas City. So you don't even have to travel. Now you're able to build a mastermind groups and organizations. I would take a look on social media, what's going on on Clubhouse. I think that's very intriguing. Uh, you know, some of you, not quite as much what Paul does, but earlier on in your trading career could possibly do group classes in Zoom, amplify your time. Yep. I mean, these are all examples of things you could do to start, to grow, to scale, and to potentially, not saying it's easy, but potentially be that million dollar a year earner in the world of fitness or being a creative or being in marketing or an agency. From my perspective, I know I'm harping on it a little bit strong here. You better understand what's going on in the digital world. You really better understand what's going on in NFTs. I think there's a tremendous opportunity there. Social tokens, blockchain, and you're probably not learning this in school. Go to YouTube, go to educators. I mean, to some degree, I do some consulting on that, but I'm very busy. I just don't have a lot of time for it. Even at the right money, I haven't built an agency yet. But right. Paul, I mean, this really has been great. If you had to leave a parting word to the audience, I wish we had a little more time to get into diet and exercise. But since we're focused on the business aspect, uh, what would be advice you would have for someone who is just not knowing where to start and now we're talking millions of dollars a year and maybe it's intimidating to them. What's the first steps they could take? 
Well, number one, if, if they decide that, okay, I want to actually have um, like some degree of success in social media, you need to figure out what is you, your best way to connect with people. For example, for me, I don't really like the reason why I don't have a YouTube is because I really don't like doing videos, but I love writing, right? So writing is my connected way. So the biggest thing is how, what is the most comfortable way and the most consistent way that you're going to be able to deliver content? So you're going to have to figure that out. And then of course the education thing, let's just pretend somebody already, already has some degree of proficiency in fitness in terms of training people or certifications or whatever. If you're trying to leverage any of your social media, if you're trying to leverage things online, you have to figure out what, what way that you can use that it's both you're consistent with and that you're pretty good with, right? Because like I said, I don't really like doing videos, but I love writing. So I can bust out a pretty incredible Instagram post in like four minutes, right? And people will freak out because it literally takes me three or four minutes to write a post. I post it up, it gets five or 6,000 likes. I get more followers, I get more subscribers, whatever. But I don't really like doing uh, videos and YouTube and stuff like that. I know people will be like, you have to do those. And I'll give it a shot at some point. But I think one of the most important things is to figure out what is a way that you're going to be consistent with. To, because you, if you're not putting out content, like I said, that's step one. Let's, let's say you already have some degree of proficiency in fitness, the education, the knowledge, whatever. So now you're like, okay, so how do I leverage that? So the most important thing is, is that most people want a degree of, they want to be either entertained or they want to be educated while they're entertained. So it's important for you to figure out what is a way that I connect with people, whether it's video, whether it's writing, something like that. What is the, what's the ways that I connect with people? I'm going to be consistent with delivering content and that I'm going to produce good content. Um, like I said, some people don't like doing videos or don't talk well on videos. I personally don't enjoy doing those, to be honest but I love writing and I'm good at writing. So that is how I leverage my business in that. And then you have to figure out, you have to be able to read the room in terms of business too, right? So medium form um, content is dead. Medium form content is dead. This is what people do now. They either want a two minute video or they want a little excerpt of something they can read or they want to sit in their bed and binge watch something all weekend. That, but medium form, and you look at some of the places now uh, like T Nation or like, you know, bodybuilding.com or whatever, medium form content, people don't want it anymore. Like those places are really struggling and they have people come in and out. They don't, they don't want to do it. So if you're going to figure out how to connect with people, make some kick-ass little TikTok videos that are like a minute long that people think are really cool that you connect, you get sure. information, you have a good product with, or write something that's really catchy and deliver that way to engage your audience to say, hey, I know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm informed. Um, I'm giving you something here that you don't currently have. So, but you have to just figure out which of those ways that you want to do it. Most people aren't going to sit around um, and watch hours and hours of your YouTube videos unless you're really awesome. So if you're going to be really, if you're going to do that, that kind of content, you better be really amazing at it. But medium, I think right now we're in a phase where medium form content is mostly dead. So you kind of need to figure out I think one time uh, I was working with a guy that worked for a large company and they had run through another company that looked at analytics and they said, you have, I want to say it's something to the tune of nine to 13 seconds to catch somebody's attention with something you post on social media. So the average person, when they're reading something you posted or a video that you posted, you got about nine seconds to grab them. After that, if, if it's not something they feel like they want to continue reading, they check right out. So believe it or not, if you go to any of my posts, the first part of it, I try to put something in there that's engaging. That's really, really important. Same with the video. If you're going to make a three minute video, you better grab somebody's attention right out of the first few seconds, right? How many times have you ever been scrolling through social media and you see a video and then something really grabs you in the first couple of minutes. Next thing you know, you've watched 15 minutes of that video because mm -hmm. it grabs you in the first 10 to 15 seconds. Same thing with reading. If you if you start a novel and you read a novel and it's boring right out of the gate, it's hard to continue plugging right on through it. But if they if it grabs you right out of the first chapter, you're like, man, this is awesome. And the next thing you know, you've read the whole book. It's just, and it's the same way with even reading a, a three minute piece. Like you don't even want to waste the three minutes. How many times have heard people say, well, that's three minutes of my life I won't get back because they felt like it was a waste of time. But if you're going to create something, 
it has to be a way that is engaging, that's informative, that people feel like I, this is information I need and I'm not currently getting from anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, if we had more time, I also could have got into repurposing content and there's digital ways in your writing and what you do, like Jack Dorsey did of Twitter with his first tweet, putting that into a digital art and NFT. That basically is just repurposing and making a truckload of money on that. Now that works when you're more of an influencer, which you would be in terms of what you do that you worked up to it. I'm gonna let you go in one minute, but I have one exercise question for you. You broke my heart when I was reading some of your IG post uh, yesterday, you do not like the landmine press. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> um, Stop doing it basically. <laughs> yeah, so so a landmine press, if you're trying to work your shoulders, uh, it, you know, in my post, I talked about that. So anytime you're you're doing any type of pressing, you're, you're working the anterior part portion of the deltoid, the one right in, in the front. So its main responsibility, the functional component, is going to be shoulder flexion, which is raising the arm like this. Yes. When you press in a landmine press, instead of the arm coming like this, the arm comes like this. So you want to take a, any type of, anytime you're working a muscle, you want to try to work it to where you shorten the distance from origin to insertion. So when you're looking at something like the anterior deltoid, you do that by working in this degree of shoulder flexion where you come like this. So when you actually push out like this, and you could actually put your hand on your anterior deltoid, and if you raise it, you will feel it shorten and contract more as you go into shoulder flexion. Hmm. When you do a landmine press, your arm goes this way. So it's not very good at number one, it doesn't work the muscle in, in two, it doesn't get into a very shortened state, which we always want to get a muscle into a shortened state. Um, or we want in, in, in like the, that type of press, we want to lengthen it and then we want to shorten it in that type of press, right? So, but not only that, as you press, that resistance drops off so significantly right after the press that you're basically just pushing your arm through the air like this. You might as well not even have any weight on the floor. There's just not anything going on right here. So, whereas if you're using a cable or using a dumbbell, we get a much longer range of motion in terms of resistance against that working muscle. Thank you, Paul. That's great. And for those that are not as familiar with you and want to learn more and follow you, whether IG or a website or what you're doing in Yoke Squad, how could they learn more about you? Right now, like I said, I pretty much, uh, I think, uh, I think if you type in Paul Carter, just on Google, I, I come right up. <laughs> so that's pretty and You're good. also lift, run, bang, at least on Instagram. Lift, run, bang, you'll find me in a multitude of places. <laughs> yes. Pretty much everything is lift, run, lift, run, bang. If you just Google it from Bang or me, uh, my name, Paul Carter, you, you'll find me at someplace somewhere. Excellent. And I'm going to try to give a little faster close than I normally do because I know Paul has to run. Everyone, I'm Angelo Robles, the host of the Angelo Robles podcast and the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. You could follow us at familyofficeassociation.com or learn more about us is what I meant to say. I'm also rather active on social media. We're Family Office on YouTube, Family Office Association on Instagram, and really love the conversation on fitness, someone like Paul, and the tremendous business opportunity for many of you. And I'm very interested in the success of high school and college students and young people that have a chance to flourish. And there's so much opportunity in today's world. Really follow what's going on in the digital community. Some of the things that I noted, there's tremendous opportunity, lots of money to be made and be very satisfying in terms of what you do. Look forward to the next time. And Paul, look forward to taking you up on Kansas City and Great Barbecue. Thank you. Absolutely, man. I look forward to it as well. My pleasure. Thank you for your time. Thanks, bud. I appreciate you.